is. But some of them pull better than others. Storm pulled from somewhere within himself, from some primitive core so strong that he could not not pull, even if he wanted to. He's also known as an honest dog. Some dogs pull and when they get tired, they slack off, but keep up enough pull on the harness tug so it appears they're working while they're really resting. When they have rested for a quarter mile or so, they go back to work. It's not bad. It's very much one of those they know you know they know situations and part of running dogs. But some dogs, and Storm was one of them, pull hard all the time, even when they are tired. These are called honest dogs, and they are keyed into running somehow more than other dogs. So into this night, in my ignorance, we started to run into what I thought would be a three or four hour easy run we started, and it was not so bad at first. Part of it showed me a new beauty. There was a full moon, and when we first started the night run, we went across a lake, a beautiful, long lake in the moonlight. The moonlight off the snow and the cold air was so bright and flat white, you could have read a book, and the dogs worked wonderfully in the cold. At the end of the lake, there was a large hill. The base of the hill was heavily forested, and the trail wound through the trees. As the dogs moved through the dark shadows of the forest and climbed the hill, we went through some strange kind of temperature inversion, and, they ju and just as they came back out into the moonlight, into the flat white light at the top of the hill, the steam from their collective breath came up and over their backs and hid them. When dogs run, they are silent. Only in the movies do they rattle and bark while they're running. So in silence, all in silence, except for the gentle huffing of their breath and the slight jingle of the harness straps, I was pulled over the top open hill in the moonlight by a steam ghost. It was heart-stoppingly beautiful. And that was part of the run. We ran down from the hill through some country that a tornado had ripped and torn. For six or seven miles, the trail wound through the wreckage of downed trees and broken limbs. It was hard going with the new snow and frequently having to stop and chop down trees with an ax, then hump the sled over them, hacking and swearing and pushing, the dogs slamming and jerking and pulling until we got through and were in the calm forest again when winding through the thick spruce trees, in and out of dappled moonlight and beauty. The sweat was freezing on the outside of my clothes as it steamed out, so I had to stop and scrape it off with a stick, and suddenly, for no reason that I knew, storm sprayed blood. In the moonlight I could not tell that it was blood, but only something dark that sprayed out of his rear end. Storm was directly in front of the sled in the wheel position, a term that dates back to stagecoaches. And it covered the front end of the sled and the slides of the trail, a sudden dark liquid. I stopped the sled and tied it off to a tree. I thought he had developed diarrhea, which was bad enough, and I ran up to his side. He stood normally, slamming into the harness to get the sled moving. The temperature had dropped still more and all the dogs wanted to run. They worked to the cold, the colder the better. The smell was wrong. As I kneeled next to him, near the stain in the snow, the smell was wrong for what I thought it was. I lit a match and was horrified to see blood. Storm was spraying blood bright red blood out of his rear end. Blood covered the sled and the trail. I had never, never seen this, known this before, had never heard a dog before. And now this. All the dogs were screaming, high-pitched, deafening screams, because they were impatient and wanted to run, knowing they were headed in the direction of home. Storm ignored me and kept screaming and lunging as if nothing were wrong. And each time he lunged, 
blood squirted. I became frantic. In my life, blood meant something bad, something fiercely bad. Blood was an end. I didn't know what to do. I stood next to him and did not know what to do. Doctor, I thought. I needed to get him to a doctor before he dies, and without any more pulling. I had to ease him down and get him to a doctor. That's all I could think. I unhooked him from the gang line and carried him, lunging and screaming to the sled. I tied him to the basket of the sled with a short piece of line to his collar. Then I stood on the runners and let the team loose. We didn't make it 50 yards before Storm went absolutely insane. When he looked ahead in the darkness and saw that the other dogs were pulling while he was riding on the sled, he went mad. He flopped and ripped and tore at the sled, at the rope holding him by the collar, at me, at the world, until he had worked himself to the side of the sled and was pulling there, pulling with the rope on his collar, pulling so his neck was warped back around. I stopped and put him back on the sled and tried to start again, but it was no good. He immediately fought to get, his, to get down again, screamed for it. And when he got down, he began to pull with his neck. I tried a longer rope, tried to let him trot in the back. That did not work either. He simply ran up alongside until the rope caught, then began to pull, his neck wrapped around the, to the side. They do not really know harness. When Captain Cook first saw Eskimos and their dogs in Alaska, they did not have harnesses. The dogs pulled from crude collars. Storm didn't care that he wasn't hooked in a harness. The collar would do fine. He pulled the way they have always pulled. And there it was. I could not stop because, because I thought if I waited too long to get him to a doctor, he would bleed to death. I could not get him to ride the sled because if I, because the, because if I did, the exertion of his slamming around trying to get back out and pull made him bleed all the more. I could not get him to trot easily along in the back. Finally, in a mad kind of worry, I took off his harness and let him run free, run free thinking he might just follow us if we made our way through the darkness. He immediately ran up and around the sled into his old position. He tried to pull even though he wasn't hooked to anything, and I thought for a moment that might work. At least he didn't have the weight of the sled to pull, but he bled anyway, and seemed to work hard anyway, and seemed to be pulling hard anyway. Because he wasn't hooked to anything, whenever there was some unevenness in the trail, he would lunge ahead and trip and nearly fall. When he stumbled, the sled almost ran over him, which almost certainly would have killed him. At last, I knew that I could do nothing but what he wanted to do. Let him pull. It was a terrible thing to learn on that night because of his blood. His blood, blood was so important to me, meant so much to me, and here it was leaving him, and I thought his life was leaving him. Finally done, I put the harness back on him and hooked him up and made the run through the night, thinking that I was allowing him to die. Seven more hours we ran. I stopped along the way to snack the dogs on dry food and bits of meat. They ate the snow, and storm pulled. Across two rivers and several lakes, and through some sharp hills in the moonlight we ran, and Storm pulled, and I waited for him to end, hating myself for doing the only thing I thought I could do. But it was nothing to him. To Storm it was all as nothing. The blood, the anxiety I felt, the horror of it, meant as little to Storm as the blood from the deer on the snow had meant to the wolves. It was part of his life. And if he could obey the one drive, the one to be in the team and pull, then nothing else mattered. And he did not die. Later, when he was very old, Storm would teach me about death, but not that night. 
That night he ran and we ran until just before dawn I could see the glow from the Coleman lamp coming through the window of the cabin across the swamp near our home. He never once faltered. It did not falter for six more years, never stopped pulling. I took the dogs out of the harness and rubbed their shoulders and marveled at Storm, who stood with his tail wagging, not bleeding any longer. I put on their chains so they could get at the fresh straw in their houses to make soft beds and realized that I had learned something again that night. I had learned that I knew not absolutely nothing. The same lesson I learned from the wolves and the doe. Knew nothing about animals, understood nothing about the drives that make them work. Knew nothing. And I also learned, as with the wolves and the doe, that I wanted to know more. Wanted to know everything there was to know about dogs in the woods and running with a team. But I had one more important lesson to learn, and it would also be in blood.